Okay, welcome everyone and welcome back to the Bretton Woods Committee's 2022 annual meeting. Uh, we've had a really fantastic start to our week and, and really constructive conversations this week. Um, if you missed it yesterday, we had a fireside chat conversation with President David Malpass. We also spoke with IMF Managing Director Kristalina Gorgieva the day before that. And we had a really uh, robust uh, and rich conversation on global supply chains to kick off our, our annual meeting on Tuesday. And I'm delighted to continue the conversation today with the topic of climate finance. Uh, and perhaps this topic has gotten a, a bit overshadowed this week by, by some of the um, you know, issues that are really at the forefront given the, the evolving and ongoing Ukraine-Russia conflict. But um, as we know, this is really an existential issue and a shared global problem that's going to require shared global solutions. So I'm uh, delighted to welcome a, a wonderful panel of experts on this topic here today um, who are gonna discuss this issue in, in depth and, and the issue of, of climate finance. Um, so before I introduce them, I just want to remind our audience that we will reserve some time at the end for audience questions. Uh, and we ask that if you have a question, you please submit it using the Q&A function here in Zoom and we'll collect those and then I'll call on individuals when it's time for Q&A. Um, so now let me briefly introduce our speakers today. As I said, we're very fortunate to have this expert panel convened. Um, first, we have with us Ravi Menon, who's the Managing Director of the Monetary Authority of Singapore. And he also chairs the network of central banks and supervisors for greening the financial system. Um, and he's also a member of the Financial Stability Board Steering Committee. So all the way from Singapore here in Washington, thank you for joining us today, Ravi. Family. Uh, we also have Laura Tyson, who's joining us from California today, and she is a distinguished professor of the Graduate School at the Haas School of Business, uh, University of California, Berkeley. Um, and she has served as a presidential advisor to President Obama and also in the Clinton administration uh, and is well versed on development issues globally. So thanks very much, Laura, for joining Thank us you. today. Thank you. And joining us from Europe, uh, we have Mr. Harry Boyd Carpenter, who's the Managing Director of Green Economy and Climate Action at the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, uh, leading their climate work. Thanks, Harry, for joining us. Thank you for inviting me. And finally, we have our uh, moderator, Asane Bejlas, who is the founder and CEO of Rock Creek Group. And Asane serves on our board of directors. Uh, she's also co-chairing our Future of Finance Working Group. Uh, and she is spearheading our climate finance project team who will be launching a, a project around climate finance um, in the weeks and months ahead. So Afsani, thank you so much for your leadership at Bretton Woods uh, and all the time that you contribute to our efforts. Uh, uh, let me now turn it over to you to facilitate today's discussion. Thank you so much, Emily. I'm so excited to be with our panel today, truly global panel from all over the world. And, um, and at the same time, I think we'll be celebrating Earth Day uh, as uh, this week. So uh, it so happens that our meeting today is, uh, is particularly um, interesting. And I wanted to thank um, not just Emily Yu, but also to the Bretton Woods uh, Committee for organizing this critical meeting um, at this very time. And as you said, uh, there is a lot going on between the, the war that has impacted uh, human lives, but also the economy and inflation rates that were going up have got even worse. And, uh, and as we've seen, the energy prices, of course, have got to levels that we have not seen in a very long time. Overall inflation, of course, is up uh, to levels that are more than you know, what we've seen in over 40 years. At the same time, the challenge in terms of the green economy remains. We all have read the IPCC reports. I remember when um, I was at the World Bank and uh, ran the energy business of the World Bank, when the IPCC reports came out, they were really reading material for experts. They were not for the general public. And the last reports that came out in 20, last year and this year really are basically uh, reports that everybody's reading, uh, old people, young people in the newspaper. And so everyone is living uh, climate change and everyone is much more on top of it, but of course, much more the young populations all over the world who are going to see the impact in their lifetime, even more than the rest of us today. And it's important to say, as uh, Treasury uh, Janet Gellan pointed out last week, um, that, um, that the uh, proposals for Bretton Woods institutions were being crafted really in the middle of the Normandy um, invasion. Uh, as it was underway. So I think there is a lot of potential on the climate front. And while we're going through all of these issues and problems and conflicts, I think at the same time, we should not lose uh, 
uh, sight of the fact that climate change, which covers not just energy, energy is a very big part of it, but food, agriculture, and we've seen with food prices where they've gone water and, um, and also nature um, really become much more important for everybody, whether it's a business, whether it is multilateral institutions or governments and private sector. So in terms of, um, in terms of um, looking at um, looking ahead, I think what uh, Treasury Yellen said is we cannot wait for a new normal. And she said that, um, as I said earlier, uh, we need much more resources and we should be counting them in trillions instead of the billions that are getting spent. Mm -hmm. And so we have the perfect panel really, I think today to discuss it. And one question I wanted to put to our panel and, um, and if we could start with you, Laura, is really um, given what is going on geopolitically with the war and, and the economic disruptions that we're all experiencing post during COVID, of course, I shouldn't say post COVID, um, do you think that we're going to have a long-term setback on climate um, in, uh, finance and improving uh, the state of the climate problems? Or do you think that what is going on, for example, with the war, is going to expedite our move towards a faster transition towards a greener economy? So I think uh, the incentives are going to be strengthened for accelerating uh, the transition. I think if you just look at it from the point of view of economic security, so security of energy supplies becomes a the highlight here of what's going on in the conflict. It's, secu it's a security. So I think that that incentive alone, when I think about the US discussion of energy and climate, it will be compelling as we have that political discussion for uh, the argument that alternative energy, uh, the electrification of the, of the grid, those, those major climate change initiatives will actually serve our national and economic security. I think that becomes a very powerful argument for skeptics. Uh, so I actually think the incentives for faster movement. Uh, now that doesn't mean, and I think what the Ukraine situation has pointed out, we all knew this, is you can't make the transition overnight. It's impossible. Our whole entire transportation and industrial structure around the world depends upon fossil fuels. So we cannot, if we're, uh, so at the same time that I think it increases the incentives to speed and scale and move away, it also in the short run means we have to do things uh, to deal with, say, the movement of natural gas from the US to Europe, or uh, the increase in uh, leases for, uh, for drilling uh, at a higher royalty rate. I don't think, the, so I don't see these things as inconsistent. I think one is a necessity, that's the system we have, and two is an increase in the incentives to move to alternatives. Anna, you're on mute. Thank you, Laura. We'll go on to Ravi. Oh. Um, thank you. Thank you, Apsani. Um, I, I think uh, before we look at what uh, the Ukraine situation has presented us with, um, useful to just uh, recap uh, where we are currently. And that's not a pretty picture. Global greenhouse mm. gas emissions have been continuing to rise in recent years. Um, CO2 emissions, uh, energy related, uh, last year rose 6%. And uh, as I think uh, Laura reminded us, fossil fuels are a big part of our economy. They account for more than 80% of global uh, primary energy consumption right now. Mm -hmm. So uh, renewable energy uh, generation has increased tremendously, but it is still not increasing at a rate that is sufficient to reach net zero by 2050. The current trajectory okay. is just not there. So okay. that's the backdrop. That's the backdrop against which we are operating. Um, the situation in, uh, presented by the war in, uh, in Ukraine uh, basically brings forward, fast forward, fast forwards the um, energy transition. We are all uh, thinking of an energy transition, as Laura said, it has to be progressive and over time, uh, but it has been now pushed forward um, and it's in a disorderly fashion. Um, We've all been want, uh, speaking of a carbon price. Well, effectively, we have an increase in carbon price. Carbon pricing across the world has gone up yes, thanks to the war. And now the key question for policymakers is this, 
we've been saying that we need a higher carbon price to effect the transition. Now that the carbon price is there, what are we going to do about it? And the worst thing we could do is to gear up uh, fossil fuel production for the short term gains of dealing with shortages and price increases, uh, or worse still, to provide subsidies, fuel subs fossil fuel subsidies, which mm -hmm. some countries have begun to do. Um, and I think that's going to be very comp that's going to complicate the transition. I know it's a tough time. Uh, people's uh, real incomes are being pinched by inflation, uh, but the way forward would be to provide fiscal assistance more generally uh, through cash transfers rather than fuel subsidies, so that the relative mm -hmm. price change that you are seeing now is maintained. You want a higher mm -hmm. price for carbon, we have it. So let's maintain that price, but because real incomes have been squeezed, uh, let's provide assistance to people and let them make the choices facing these new relative prices, higher price for carbon, lower price for, for clean energy. And if that, that uh, can, we can stick to that for the next few years, that will help the transition. So, um, and the other thing of course, is to double up on public investments in renewables. Uh, and I also agree, Laura, that from an energy security point of view, that makes sense because most, most countries import uh, fossil fuel-based energy. Right. And so from a security point of view, it makes sense. Now for small countries like Singapore, we have a challenge with renewables. Uh, you just mm. don't have enough space to capture that mm. much sunlight or wind power. But leaving mm -hmm. that aside, most countries do have that option. Mm -hmm. um, one question I would raise and I don't have the answer to is even from an energy security point of view, uh, the raw materials and inputs that you need for renewables come from mm -hmm. a small group of countries. Mm -hmm. And so again, uh, that's something uh, that is actually generating some discussion as to whether you're substituting one kind of energy dependent <laughs> on fossil fuels right. or something else. <laughs> uh, but that's something that needs to be addressed uh, and thought through because there is a trilemma now between um, energy security, environmental sustainability, and uh, economic growth um, mm -hmm. or, or living standards. Uh, there is a way to square that. In the short term, it's going to get more difficult, but I kind of am hopeful that over the medium to long term, the higher carbon price presented to us is an opportunity and should move us in the right direction on the energy transition. Thank you. <laughs> finger on a number of things, and I would actually like to come back to Laura in a second after we hear from Harry, because you also you know, covered the really important topic of climate justice and access for lower income in all countries, but particularly in the most fragile uh, developing countries, which as you said, is a very mm -hmm. challenge. Um, and then of course the price of minerals, as you said, so we'll come back to that, I think, um, if you don't mm -hmm. mind uh, in a few minutes, because that is also mm -hmm. an incredibly important point. But I also wanted to mention, it's interesting because I think There'll be some um, announcements today from the White House here in the US about um, natural capital um, uh, accounting and, and talking about that subject uh, shortly because uh, that covers sort of not just energy, but all the other ingredients as you talked about. But let's go on to Harry to get your thoughts. Well, thank you, Asana. I mean, I think really as Laura and Ravi already outlined, it's a, it's a complex picture. I mean, there are some elements where clearly you know, the Russian invasion of Ukraine and, and all of the consequences of that have very negative impacts. I mean, it's a challenge to the multilateral order. It's a challenge to the, the, the sort of global cooperation that we need in order to deal with a, a global problem. That's highly problematic. Um, it's also going to drain Western donor funds that, you know, might otherwise go to promote climate action. I think inevitably, and we see this already, that the, the enormous needs that Ukraine has are, are more urgent, more pressing. I mean, then, you know, climate change remains a, a vital issue, but it's clearly going to create much greater demand for the sorts of capital that was, public capital that was needed uh, to address the climate issue. On the other hand, I think, as Laura rightly said, I mean, this, what, what you also see is the sort of perfect alignment now between economics, because renewable energy is the cheapest form of energy, and energy security, because, you know, <laughs> nobody can interrupt the supply of wind and solar, um, political economy, because you don't have to buy from one particular producer mm -hmm. or, or, or two particular producers. Um, <clears throat> and so, you know, they, all of those things are now perfectly aligned to put 
an enormous encouragement behind renewable energy. And you can see that in the in the EU response. I mean, the Commission, many of you will have seen, the Commission came out very promptly after the war uh, started with, with a proposal to effectively reduce European dependence on Russian gas very dramatically in the short term. One, some of that is clearly just realignment of, of sources of gas. But there's also a fundamental focus on reduction on gas demand. And, and when you look at that reduction in, in gas demand, you have to measure it against what was already a very ambitious baseline. I mean, the European ambition to reduce gas consumption by 2030 was already very high. The further reductions that they plan, you know, are really based around accelerating renewable energy, um, targeting the, the, the major barriers to that, and then also a focus on, on hydrogen and clean gases, and uh, so that's biomethane as well. So I think, you know, what this in, in fundamental terms, what this has done is strengthen the incentives, strengthen both the economic and political incentives to go towards renewable energy. And if you look at the, you know, if you look at the shifts we need to make between now and 2030, you know, if you look at, for, in particular, if you look at the IEA net zero roadmap and say, okay, what are the prime components of the, the emissions reductions we need in the next eight years? It's really about wind and solar. Um, it's about wind and solar and it's about energy efficiency and electrification right. transport. We have a huge challenge to come around uh, the, the decarbonization of heating, the decarbonization of shipping, of, the, of aviation, and of hard to abate industries. But actually, we don't need to solve that challenge by 2030. Um, you know, we have a pathway, and the pathway doesn't need us to solve all of those issues by 2030. What we really need to do by 2030 is we need to massively decarbonize electricity generation. And we know how to do that. And we know it's affordable. And we know that it's that it's highly secure sources of energy. So I think that's the very positive upside, awesome. that we have a affordable, mm -hmm. politically attractive um, solution that just got comparatively even more affordable and politically much more attractive. Mm -hmm. Harry, on that front, you mentioned solar and wind, obviously, but I think in Europe also, you're kind of ahead on hydrogen. And then there's the big debate, obviously, on nuclear. But very specifically, um, the countries that you cover at EBRD, particularly, um, as you're talking about this transition that is getting mm -hmm. sort of um, on a faster track, you also have, at the same time, countries that are 35% more uh, energy intensive than the rest of the world. And also, on top of that, I, I think, if I'm correct, um, the coal accounts for 40 percent of total energy use again in the countries that you cover i remember working years ago on the private yeah. of the energy sector in poland when i was at the banks and you know obviously coal was big but a little bigger than 40 percent but it's still 40 percent so as you're looking at that and you know talking about what you just talked about is the challenge can we really get where we want to get on this expedited um sort of timing that you timeline that you talked about? Uh, it's a very good question. I mean, you know, the, the coal one is, is, is particularly challenging. And I think, you know, to see what happens to, to, to you know, to re, we, we have to rethink a little bit the way we've been thinking about coal and especially the coal exit up to now. I mean, you rightly said, you know, EBRD operates in a, in a set of countries, many of whom are legacy countries of the USSR uh, or, the, or, the, or the satellite states of the USSR. And they typically still have infrastructure which is highly industrialized, um, highly energy intensive, emissions intensive, and often coal based. I think you can probably sort of think about us in coal, and for us at least, in three broad categories. You have the EU countries, um, which are coal burners. And there, I think probably 2022, 2023, you will see more coal consumption um, because people will, will you know, keep coal plants running a little bit longer or perhaps not necessarily keep them alone, but running longer, but burn, use them a bit more than they planned. Um, I don't see new investment in coal in the EU, European Union. Um, I think, to be frank, that ship has sailed and, and thank goodness it has. And that's because of a combination of factors that's um, high carbon price. You know, we have a genuinely meaningful carbon price in the EU and that's hugely effective in shifting economic behavior. Um, we have an absence of finance. You know, finances will not, will not touch coal in the EU. Um, we have consumer preference. You know, people don't want coal power. Um, and we have just a political acceptance and recognition that coal has an exit. Even in Poland, you know, which you mentioned, is a hugely coal-reliant country. The government's taken some very tough, very bold decisions um, to exit coal. And I, I don't see that, that changing. So I don't see new investment in coal. Then we have a number of countries in Central Asia, which are coal-reliant, um, but which also have gas reserves. Um, I'm thinking particularly of Kazakhstan. 
think there again i mean when the, the coal exit still makes sense um we do have to, we, the, the balkan countries i think will have a very challenging question to answer oh. um because they don't have domestic gas um and in the past you might have thought of a coal to gas transition that may still be the answer but it's an answer that requires a lot more thought than it did because the the, the attractiveness of gas the political security of gas is not the same and i think you know, it's not a region we're active in, but the, you know, East Asia, I think it will be, you know, if you, if you think about where does the coal exit really have to happen, it has to happen, you know, India, China, Philippines, you know, Indonesia, there, I think, you know, as I say, EBRD is not active, but that is, that is going to be a massive issue. Will, will the increased price, both economic and political, and, and the reduced availability of gas, delay a coal exit in East Asia? That, that I think is going to be a very, a very important question, a very challenging question. And then to answer your more general question, I mean, is it possible? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I do think that what was really helpful about the IEA roadmap is that it really made clear that, you know, to get to, get to where we need to get to for 2030, I mean, you think we all know in, in rough numbers, what do we need to do? We need to reduce emissions to zero by 2050 or to net zero by 2050, and we need to round about half them by 2030. And what the IEA roadmap showed is, look, to get to, 20, to the 2050 goal right now is very challenging, and we don't have all the technologies available. Um, but to get to the 2030 goal is actually okay. okay. You know, it's, it requires huge investment. It requires huge regulatory reforms, but we have the technologies and it is affordable. Um, and that's what I see. I mean, you know, countries that have, it, and it is, you know, really a lot about the electric, the, 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 the introduction, introduction of renewables for electricity. Countries that have pushed hard with that are able to invest really fast and really affordably. So, uh, yeah, I'm still an optimist about the 2030 targets. And when I get to 2030, I'll start worrying about the 2040 targets. Makes me feel a little better today. <laughs> All right. You've uh, obviously been involved in the U.S., but also globally. And um, yeah. as here in the U.S., the Biden administration passed the $1.75 trillion infrastructure bill in 2021 which was uh, called the largest effort in US history to combat uh, climate change. Um, do you, how do you see, do you do a lot of work both with companies, with, uh, in academia, with the multilaterals, with the government? How do you see climate finance being combined with the way infrastructure is getting built and the lessons uh, that you're seeing in good cases? How can we apply them here in the US, but also how can we apply them in developing countries? Okay, um, I want to. Um, it's a great question, and I I want to start um, with the observation about getting to 2030 because I do. You can see this in the infrastructure bill in the United States. You can see it in the Build Back Better bill that hasn't passed. The emphasis is significantly on alternative energy related to electrification and uh, the acceleration of wind and solar and alternative energy. I think that pathway uh, does exist. The technologies exist. Uh, the financing for them in the private sector uh, exists. Uh, the incentives are there to do this um, and the technology is there. So I am going to say what, what, the, what these bills do is enhance the incentives. For example, in the uh, bipartisan infrastructure bill, there is a lot of funding for um, the build out of a national electrification network. If we're going to have electric vehicles, we have to have essentially the highways for electric vehicles. We have to have a network of charging stations. California is doing that. A number of other states are doing that. This bill will help the states do that. Um, and that's very important. Another important aspect of that bill, the bipartisan infrastructure bill, there is a lot of funding uh, in for the Department of Energy to uh, do demonstration hubs and to support R&D. This is on technologies that are already in process uh, and to accelerate their, uh, their adoption. And their, and their scale. There are um, another important issue, if we're gonna make the transition in transportation to uh, alternative energy, we have got to encourage more public transportation, more public transit. That's a big issue in the United States and I'm sure in many other countries as well. And we have to make sure that the 
acquisition of the alternative energy vehicles uh, is easy. We, we, we need to have uh, credits, we need to have tax credits uh, to, to get people to purchase this fast. So I think that um, those are just a variety of different ways that the bill is uh, focused on moving the process forward. I agree that um, between now and 2030, we have most of the technology. So it's a question of speeding them to market. It's a question of getting people to adopt them faster through the incentive structure uh, that they face when they buy an automobile. So, you know, a lot of people right now have found, uh, again, partly because of supply change, partly because the increase in demand has been so dramatic, they can't get they can't get a hybrid vehicle. They can't get an electric vehicle. And then if they get the electric vehicle, they can't find a place to charge the electric vehicle. So I think there are lots of things we can do to accelerate uh, this. And those are in uh, the bill. Um, I worry though, and this gets to climate finance. So different projects have different degrees of risk and different degrees of uncertainty. So I would argue, uh, and there's been a very strong statement of this by a very interesting new fund called Just Climate, which grows of uh, generation investment. And they assess the funds around the world that are committed to, say, uh, net zero companies. And they say, God, we have trillions of dollars, $57 trillion of assets under management are committed to companies <laughs> that have net zero commitments, just as an example, okay? Um, yes, but that capital, is it going to be deployed on the right projects in the right places at the right speed? And the right places here, I wanna to get to, you mentioned uh, the issue of equity and just, and just climate justice, climate mm -hmm. justice. Right. But think about it also from the point of view of around the world. A lot of that money, that significant amount of money may, because of risk, and because of the kinds of projects involved, may not be interested in making investments in the less developed, poorer parts of the world. So the issue of here's the capital, how do we deploy it to the right projects and in the right places? And I actually do worry about the place issue. I, I really do. Um, and I think there, that's where you get to the role of the Bretton Woods institutions. That's where you get to the role of how do we take public institutions committed to economic development and actually use their funds, which are never going to be adequate to solve the problem. You've got to have the private capital. Okay, that, that's it. You have to have the private capital. But the public capital can be a leverage point and it can be a de-risking point. And it can be a blended finance point to de-risk. These are incredibly important things to do. So I think we need to think about the, how much capital do we need? And, and I'll use the kind of McKinsey most recent number, you know, 3.5 trillion increase in investment on alternative energies each year through 2050. That's a lot of money. But if you look at the global financial markets and you look even at that asset under management figure that I mentioned, we got the money, okay? But, 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 then we have the deployment gap and the deployment gap gets to what projects, where, when. And I think those are really important things. And I think there, the financial institutions like the IMF and the World Bank have to play, have to play a role. And I would like them to play a more active role. I don't think they're actively enough engaged at this point, frankly. So uh, my challenge to them, would be when you're looking at your development projects and you're looking at your macroeconomic assessments of countries, climate risk, climate finance must be taken into account. So um, that's actually a perfect segue, um, Laura, to going to Ravi, because you sit in the Monetary Authority of Singapore and you have your own um, green finance action plan, Ravi. At the same time, you have um, entities in Singapore like GIC and Tamasek who've been leaders in investing in climate tech and in climate in general. And uh, so when you sort of look at it from where you sit based on the lessons you're learning, can you share what are the key ingredients for coming up with sort of a, a green finance ecosystem? And this is sort of going back to Laura's point is there a way where you see multilateral banks coming in or any other institution, but particularly multilateral banks to do the de-risking you need 
um, for certain kinds of sustainable, again, as you've all said, there are a lot of projects, um, and Harry said this, that are extremely economic, but there's some public goods that do need uh, de-risking. So do you see any of that? And uh, could you share your thoughts? Yeah, <clears throat> thanks. Um, it's indeed a, a, a very relevant question. Um, if, if we asked ourselves what needs to be done globally uh, to get us onto a net zero, credible net zero pathway, I'd say four things. You need some kind of carbon pricing. Now, this is not going to be global or universal, but if enough countries have carbon pricing of reasonably uh, at reasonable levels, that should do. I, I don't think we want to aim, aim for perfection here. Second, you need emission standards. Pricing alone mm -hmm. can't do it. You mm -hmm. need some emission standards. Again, mm -hmm. if there's not going to be a global standard, but again, if a critical number of countries were to do meaningful things, that would be great. Three, you need investments in renewables technologies. You need some technological breakthroughs beyond 2030 to mm -hmm. close that gap mm -hmm. uh, that's needed, right? Um, and to make them scalable. And fourth, and this is what I, I think uh, we're discussing right now, uh, you need green finance. You need sustainable a sustainable finance ecosystem. Uh, so greening the financial system in order to green the rest of the economy and decarbonize economy is a critical lever. So this is a fourth, fourth lever. And I, I'll maybe speak more to it uh, from, you know, both from my uh, perspective at the Monetary Authority of Singapore, but also from the perspective of the Network for Greening the Financial System, which mm -hmm. is a body that began just four years ago with about 10 members and it's now grown to 110 central mm -hmm. banks and regulators who all now share a common concern and a resolve that you should use what can, how can the financial system be a force for change in greening uh, the economy? Uh, I'd say there are a few things that are required. One, to change behavior of financial institutions, they need to be sensitized to the risks that climate poses, both the physical risks and the transition risks. And this is something that the NGFS has been working on um, to inject realism about the necessity for environmental risk management. And, and uh, at, at the MAS, we've issued guidelines on environmental risk management, not just to banks, but to asset managers, to insurance companies, capital market service providers, because these risks are going to be faced by all financial institutions. What are your stranded assets going to be like in 10 years time under assumptions of, say, a tripling of carbon prices? Very plausible and something that you need to prepare for. Uh, breakthroughs in technologies, how is that going to change your portfolio and your mm -hmm. returns? So. I think we need to inject that. And another way to inject realism, because we really don't know the, the future, um, is to use climate scenarios and use them as the basis for conducting stress tests on your portfolios. And the NGFS has come up with a set of scenarios, climate scenarios, which are based on the IPCC scenarios, customized to, in macroeconomic terms to what would be relevant for financial institutions. And I think some se several central banks have started to use them uh, for their stress tests, and the MAS is going to be using them this year uh, mm -hmm. to inject climate scenarios, to stress test the portfolios, and then for the banks to do the sensible thing to defend themselves against these stress, uh, these risks. So that will go some way towards greening the financial system. Uh, but that would not be enough. You then second, you need to develop innovative solutions. Uh, we're seeing an increase in green loans and sustainability lo linked loans, green bonds, sustainability linked bonds, and so on. Uh, on the insurance side, we're also seeing new innovations. You need a lot more financial innovation and new instruments that will address some of these needs. Um, three, you need data, you need better definitions, and you need disclosure. First, we need to be able to capture data well. What is the carbon footprint of my customer or client? What is the effectiveness of the carbon, the abatement measures that are being undertaken? There's a need to measure this data accurately. And today it is not available in many instances. And that's why you have greenwashing and you have problems extending green loans even if you want to. Uh, definitions, taxonomies, there has to be some degree of uh, comparability across definitions used as to what is green and what is brown. A uh, third is disclosure. Uh, if this is not, if climate risks and exposures are not disclosed, 
you will not get action. And so the work of the ISSB under the auspices of IOSCO to come up with a global reporting standard is really critical. And globally, the regulators and securities regulators in particular are moving towards that to make this mandatory and, uh, requirement. And the US SEC has been at the forefront of this to require disclosure. This will go a long way because if you're forced to disclose, you've got to make sure it's correct. And then you go to look for the data, verify it and so on. So I think this will help to build, strengthen that ecosystem. The last, I think, is a point that you made earlier on, which is the need for public-private collaboration. Uh, Laura is right. There is abundant private capital to do the job, but it is not going to be deployed until the risk-return trade-offs are addressed. Right. And today we have an ecosystem problem. We have a coordination problem. The public sector cannot be using its own balance sheet to advance the green agenda. There's just not enough fiscal space. The balance sheets of even the MDBs are not enough, even with capital increases. So you've got to find a way to synergize this. And this is this solution has eluded people for so long that if you can bring public capital in concessionary capital form, its main objective is to actually multiply and leverage and bring in much more private capital, mm -hmm. five times more or 10 times more, then you can do the job. Um, you can draw on other sources of capital that are also of a concessionary nature, uh, philanthropic capital, um, family offices, those who want to do good with their money, not looking for a return, but actually looking for an impact. Mm -hmm. That can be a loss absorber and taker of first loss, first risk. And then you have to multiply, but you need proper governance because you still need to measure the outcomes when you bring these into platforms and finance projects that the projects actually yield uh, greenhouse gas emissions reductions. So you need governance, you need the, the commitment of policymakers to make the necessary changes so that this, this, these projects will succeed. So there's a whole ecosystem that we need to build. And uh, I, I would strongly second the call that this is something that, uh, that the national authorities, the MDBs and the private sector needs to get together and try to find solutions. I would say start with small pilot projects that mm -hmm. test some of these structures and solutions in particular contexts, in particular geographies, and see which ones will work and then gain from the experience and then move on. Thank you, I'll stop here. Thank you very much, uh, Ravi, for this very thoughtful um, answer. And um, you sort of opened up a um, whole set of other questions, but um, I, I'm, I'm going to Harry, but really for any of you also to comment um, after Harry does, you know, what is, in practice, it's, I, I completely agree that you do need to do these experiments. At the same time, you know, everything is about the urgency of the, and the scale of the problem, right? So <laughs> we have to weigh one versus the other. But then very specifically, when we look in practice, I think um, you all know that um, the G7 had said that, you know, they would put in about a hundred billion in 2020 into the lowest income countries for climate change. We're now in 2022, none of that has come through, right? So how are you going to encourage and, um, and you know, Harry, you know, how, you know, you sit at EBRD not to put you, you know, uh, <laughs> sort of in a difficult position, but how do we get um, the institutions, you know, um, government, if, you know, you had to sort of come up with a solution and then any, uh, Laura and Ravi, if you have any comments, how do we get this moving? Because that's one of the things that, as uh, Emily said, at the Bretton Woods Committee, as part of this working group on climate, we want to work on. So any thoughts or ideas? Sure, well, look, it's an absolutely critical question. I mean, you mentioned the 100 billion climate finance figure, and that is such an important figure. Um, I mean, to be fair, I think, you know, the, 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 the sort of achievement is not 100, but it is at least 80, and that isn't good enough. And, and that was very clearly recognized in the Glasgow Climate Pact. Um, I think, you know, as MDBs, I can tell you the, the, the incentives on us and the, and the ambitions on our side are, are very high. Um, you know, we did our highest level ever of climate finance last year, but also importantly, we, we had our highest ever level of climate mobilization last year. So I, I, there isn't a simple answer, I'm afraid. It isn't a case of sort of waking up a group of MDBs and saying, oh, hang on, didn't you know there was a climate crisis? We, you know, we're very aware and, and our shareholders 
if we if we weren't aware, they certainly make sure we are at every turn. I think what we I I mean there are always there, there's always there's always more than one answer. But what we I think identify as a critical answer, and and, and Laura and Ravi both mentioned this, it's not a shortage of finance. There is a there is a lot of money out there. There's a you know MDBs sure the the volumes are not sufficient, but if you look at the other investors lining up alongside us, there really is a lot of money out there. The question you then have to ask is why isn't it going to green projects? And there and there, there are really two broad categories of projects. So one is green projects that make sense commercially, that, that can make it that, that, that are good business sense, but they still aren't happening. And then the most obvious example is renewable energy. Pretty much every country in the world now, a wind or a solar plant is the cheapest way to get a kilowatt hour of electricity. And everybody wants electricity. And they aren't happening typically because of problems like permitting, um, insufficient networks, in, insufficient uh, institutional capacity. Um, so that's, that's a critical issue to solve. But it, that isn't about necessarily de-risking, and it isn't about um, you know some clever financing structure. Because however clever and whizzy your sort of structured product that we devise in you know working with the World Bank and EIB and all the you know the, the full sort of the full get bag of, of acronyms, you know, that isn't going to solve the problem. That there's no cadastral register, so a developer can't get the land for the wind farm because they don't know who owns it. That's the sort of nitty gritty problem. And if you certainly if you look at Europe. Why is European renewable developments uh, not moving at the pace it needs to? It's all about permitting. Um, so I think you know you, you need to you need to identify that set of projects which make commercial sense and say it's not about cheap money, it's not about grant money, it's about yeah. identifying and eliminating the bureaucratic the, or, or the institutional loopholes that are that are stopping it happening. The second set of projects are the projects that don't yet make commercial sense. And those are around, most obviously, EVs. You know, EVs are really close to being the sort of renewables of the next decade in that they're scalable, they make sense, they're just not quite obviously cost competitive. Um, and then you're talking about things like heating, hard to abate sectors, hard, heavy industry. You know, wh why isn't, and, and there I think you've got to look at the targeted application of concessional finance, focusing though on the green premium. I'm always a little bit nervous when I hear about de risking because. The mm -hmm. problem with some of them, a lot of these projects is it's not a risk, to be honest. No. It's a certainty, but they don't work. You know, I would, <laughs> finance, I would love to finance a green steel project right now. Let's take <laughs> Egypt, which is a very important country for EBID. Egypt has amazing renewable energy resource. They've done fantastic work to develop that sector. You know, it should be a great place to do green steel. The problem is people, consumers won't pay. The premium for green steel mm -hmm. that's beginning to shift but right now they will not pay that so mm -hmm. you, you can't you know that's not about de-risking because it's it's not a risk that i'll lose money if i invest okay. in a green steel project it's a certainty um so there's no point putting a first loss tranche in there what you actually need to do is you need to create the demand for green steel and you can either do that by introducing mandates and i think you know the developed world needs to be looking at itself and saying okay if we mean this you know why for example isn't our government procurement embedding green in its, in its procurement standards? Why is, are we as consumers not turning to the people who sell to us and saying, I want a low carbon product, please, and I'm willing to pay a premium for it? Um, it's also about covering that, using public money to cover that premium. Um, and so, for example, the German government has a scheme now that will offer a contract for differences for green, for green hydrogen. I think that's an excellent way of approaching it. So I think, you know, there's no simple answer, but it's really around, first of all, understanding which products makes sense commercially already, and then targeting your efforts, not necessarily your money, but your efforts to eliminate the barriers. And then also looking at those products which are close to being commercially viable, but need that extra push. And then really figuring out whether through mandates uh, or through some form of subsidy, how do you tip those into commercial viability? The financial innovation to me is not the missing piece. I mean, I often say, you know, if financial innovation was the solution, we would have solved the problem a long time ago because we've known since 2008 that the world has no shortage of financial innovation. It probably has a surplus of it. I'm going to come so, back. So, so can I oh, let you hear from Laura and? You no, know, I, I just want to. I want to uh, ask a, a question. I, I, look, I, I actually completely agree that that we should, in discussing finance, we really should uh, make a distinction between the alternatives that are commercially already viable. And and by the way. It was certainly the use of, in the United States, I'll just, that's the case I know best, 
It was Department of Energy loans. It was generous tax subsidies on the use of wind and the use of solar. It was generous permitting uh, that led to this revolution uh, yeah. of commercial opportunities in this alternative space. And, it, and I think that's gonna happen in, we're right at the point of that on electric vehicles in general. So it's, it's been a fantastic story of using public policy, including research and development policy, because if you go back in time, what you see is the DOE had significant role to play in some of the research that led to these technologies. They're now commercially viable. The issue is, I think, as you said, it's permitting and, 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 and just getting it done. Um, that does leave, however, a pretty significant uh, amount of projects uh, that are not there, partly because of the uncertainty of the technology itself. Uh, one estimate I saw is that right now, um, only about 10% of the, the finance that is available out there, only about 10% of it is going to the activities that account for about 50% of the admissions. So basically, you don't, you don't, you, mm. those, are, those are the things like, the longer term steel and, uh, and uh, buildings and aviation. And, and there, I think I completely agree. That's where we're going to have to have a combination of policies, uh, mandates, regulation. I think in the US, we're not gonna go the mandate route. We might go the mandate route in some states. I think in California, we go the mandate route some of the time, but you have to do it through the incentives that actually increase the reduce the risk, increase the procurement, the pace of research and development, something to move those projects along. Because frankly, the hardest to decarbonize projects where the green premium is highest, we really are gonna to have to tackle those. And, and I do worry that with all of the finance out there, we have not created a picture, a set of incentives that makes investment in those kinds of things financially attractive, okay? So all of that, most of this money, as you know, in the private sector is really from the public, publicly traded uh, markets and the, and, and the investment grade bond markets. That's where the bulk of the money is for this. And they're, they're not seeing yet the commercial, uh, you, it, it's either risk uncertainty. Some of these technologies are risky because they don't have a track record. So there is risk, but let's just say not, they're not commercially viable at this point, or they're to some extent, uh, we just don't know. We're developing, we're trying to develop oftentimes with nonprofit money, I would say with a public or with corporate money, there's an effort afoot to try to work on the development of less carbon emission aviation fuel. Mm -hmm. There are projects looking at this on, on, the, on the steel industry and the cement industry. If you look at the source of investment in those, you actually tend to see some public money and some nonprofit money <laughs> um, trying to get these things started to get them to a point where you could say, yeah, look, this technology exists. It's commercially could be viable. Let's take a look at it to the private investing market. So I, I think we... I don't know. I'm going to leave as an open question whether we need new forms of financial innovation. But I do think we have got to figure out a way through all the other public policies we've talked about, R&D, tax incentives, mandates. We've got to figure out a way to take this very significant set of decarbonization technologies, which are not yet commercially attractive opportunities and make them commercially attractive financial opportunities uh, that we have to do that to get to 2050. And while I'm very like you, just incredibly optimistic about getting to 2030 based on the things that are already commercially viable, I, I do worry about that longer term path. And I worry about the, the developing countries, the lower income countries, because I could see a pathway to this in the United States. And I, I sound like there's a pathway to this in Europe in 2030, but is there a pathway that makes sense to the governments, consumers and producers of a lower income country, even to get to 2030 using the, the technologies we currently have. So I would ask you both for your answers to that. Um, I, so if I could just add to what Laura said, while I agree that, you know, um, with everything that has been said, at the same time, 
the other hundred billion magical number is all the all the multilaterals put together, right? The money that goes up annually is around a hundred billion. So that in itself is a drop in the bucket and it's going into not just climate, but health, education, um, ho housing, all, all kinds of areas, soft areas, financial sector, everything that the multilaterals are doing. So if you even wanted to say, you know, not be super ambitious, but say, I want to, um, you know, do five times that, right? And, um, you know, with all the things that you said, you do need some form of, you know, not just going to the governments and asking for sort of a handout, but there has to be some form of not, again, necessarily, um, you know, super uh, complicated uh, new financial innovations, but using some of the existing innovations, whether it is leveraging the cap existing capital more or whether it is, you know, within obviously good risk parameters, or okay. it is um, it is getting, um, getting um, you know, within, again, existing, uh, areas, maybe structuring the existing debts on the books of the World Banks and others so that you have room for more lending. Um, starting with you, Ravi, any thoughts? Because, or do you think, you know, it's going to stay at this 100 million? And we, because that is really not very much. And I think when the Bretton Woods um, institutions were created, the idea was that they would be transformational. Yeah. Um... I, I, I must say this this has been this has been a good good rich discussion and I think we're getting uh, a variety of perspectives they're not in conflict they're not inconsistent I think we are just emphasizing different things right. uh, and I think all of yes, them are yeah. important given the scale of the problem that we have and the multifaceted nature of the challenges we need all of that I do uh, I'm with Laura that we need new financing innovation. You need stronger public-private partnerships and you need to scale up and leverage more private capital. And public capital must be used intelligently. Mm -hmm. But I also fully agree with Harry, getting the financing right is not going to be sufficient. You need the policies, the regulations and the backing of the governments. And so when you enter a program like this, what the financial institutions are looking out for are two things. Do I have some cover for my risk? Of course, they will ask for the sky and I don't think they, we should give them that but we should give them some cover for the risk. But they're also asking for certainty in policies. Is the government going to see through this? Will I get my permits? Will the regulations be changed and change the nature of the, will it change the economics of the project? So I think this is where there's got to be strong national government's commitments alongside any MDB funding and private capital coming in. So it is really an ecosystem of different stakeholders uh, pledging to do their part as part of an overall overall practice. And even within the financial system, I'd just like to add, it's not just the banks uh, who originate these loans and who can kind of understand these issues very well. There's a large pool of capital in the, in the capital markets, in institutional funds, looking for ESG fund uh, investments. Mm -hmm. Now, they're not going to be investing in a solar plant. They're not going to be investing in a, in a, in a wind turbine. They want a packaged product. And so we also need solutions where loans are taken off the balance sheet of banks, and may I say also the MDBs, so that the capital is recycled, but you package them and structure them in a form that can be then subscribed to and bought by institutional investor funds, sovereign mm -hmm. wealth funds, insurance funds, pension funds. Okay. They can't be taking too much risk. They need diversification of risk. So these things need to be packaged and structured. Now, this is not rocket science innovation. It's been done before in small scale, but it's never been done on a bigger scale, not been done in this sense. And I think with a little effort, we can get there. Mm. I want to close one more point I want to make. And, uh, it, and this is where some form of de-risking and policy uh, and regulatory support is necessary. And this is the problems in Asia. Asia is where the climate battle is one of lost. Mm -hmm. Asia accounts for 45% of global emissions. Energy demand in Asia is still growing rapidly. Right. With mm -hmm. Some estimates to double in 2030. There are 45 million people in Southeast Asia without electricity. Now, and there are coal power power plants still being built. So the nature of the challenge there is transition financing. It's not about getting them to invest in a, in a solar plant or, or a wind turbine, that, that is 
just not going to provide the base load of electricity for hundreds of villages in a province. So there you need to have a transition pathway. For Asia, it is critical that we need to solve the problem of transition finance. How are you going to get them to retire their coal power plants mm -hmm. over a period of time and then mm -hmm. gradually move on to cleaner fuels from coal to natural gas and then from natural gas to renewables? There's got to be a transition pathway that makes sense for developing countries so that they're not faced with the choice of choosing between development and decarbonization. The two can go together, but you need to twin them in a way that a transition pathway that makes sense for them and also the financing for that. And that financing is difficult because the easiest thing for a bank to do is to exit from coal and invest in solar. But if you look at the bulk of his portfolio, it is actually going into activities that are in between emitting carbon, but not very but not with very low energy efficiency, high energy intensity or carbon intensity, um, that's where the transition needs to take place. Uh, and we heard examples of aviation, maritime, building construction. You do not exit from those, uh, but you can't carry on as normal too because you have to hold them to a transition pathway of reducing carbon over a period of time upon which financing is conditional, both public and private financing. So I think we need to bring that dimension of transition pathways into the equation. And again, that's why you need then innovations in finance, you need innovations in regulation and commitments to uh, a policy pathway and assurance that regulation and permits and licensing will all be in order. Thanks. Thank you. That is such an important point. And uh, if I may, I would love to get Harry's and Laura's um, thoughts also on this transition. And I think there's two kinds of that is the big transition. But also at the moment, some of the multilaterals like the World Bank, uh, I think are not allowed to, for example, lend to natural gas. So if you have local natural gas in a developing country and you're going to replace coal with natural gas, you will not get lending. So I don't know what you're doing in EBRD. It would be interesting to hear that, but also Laura from you to hear um, how you think this transition um, can proceed and how do you get that financed? Um, Harry, did you want to comment? Yeah, so, so uh, j just before I, I talk about that extremely sensitive topic, um, you know, I, I, I wanted to pick up just generally on this idea of how you create the demand for, for green products and so on. And I, I, the point that Ravi made earlier, I wanted to reinforce is that the single best way to do that is a carbon price. Um, and I, you know, because it's an economy wide signal. And I think, again, I mean, Laura touched on this with the, 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 what we saw in the renewables industry. You know, it's really important to look at renewables because it is the great success story and it's the source of hope. You know, and I, you know, I was part of finance. I mean, I financed solar, a solar project in Jordan in 2014 where the tariff was uh, $17 cents, above $17 cents per kilowatt hour. You know, that is eight times what the price is now in the Middle East. That is remarkable, extraordinary. And this is a super scalable, super clean, you know, fantastic technology. And, and that, that is really amazing. And what happened? I mean, Laura described what the, the US incentives, the tax credit, the equivalent in Europe was the feed-in tariff. Creating that demand for the green product drove the, the market, the private sector to innovate, to be super competitive, super aggressive. I mean, I know because I felt that, you know, I was the, the lender with the, the, the developers coming to me saying, you better take another 50 basis points off that interest rate, you know, or we're going to go somewhere else. That was the pressure that drove the price down. So when, when government intervention created demand for green, the private sector, the market delivered. And we need to take that model and replicate it in EVs, in industry with sustainable aviation fuels. So that, that and, and the best way to do that is through a carbon price. I, I, I think that is a critical, a critical point. So sorry, that was a way of do dodging your question. Um, <laughs> I'll stop dodging. And it's an, you know, as you can imagine, discussion about fossil fuel financing for an MDB, well, frankly, for any responsible lender is hugely sensitive. Right, of course. Our position remains um, that we, we continue to be open to, we don't finance coal at all. We, we think that coal has no place in, in future energy mix. The faster you get out of coal, the better. Um, we don't finance upstream oil and gas. Um, we, we, we would look at, at methane abatement, but that's a slightly different point. We, we, we agree with the IEA position that says, we have found and are exploiting all the oil and gas fields we will ever need. So there's no need to start looking for new ones. Um, we do finance 
um, in rare and exceptional circumstances, midstream gas facilities of some form. Um, and then that could be pipelines and it could it could be, you know, heating distribution networks, and it could also be gas fired gen electricity generation. We do it very rarely, but we do it where we believe that it will accelerate the transition. Right. And for us, looking at our cohort of countries, that's particularly around a coal exit. As I said earlier in the session, I think that's an argument that will get only harder to make. But we do believe the space is open because Rev is absolutely right. If you don't offer people, you know, if, if, you, if you ask people to trade off energy security for decarbonization, they'll jump for energy security. Um, so you have to offer, you have to be able to show a pathway that is, that is you know, that, that ensures stable supply of energy. And in many cases, that does mean some role for gas. And interestingly, if you look at the way gas is evolving in the European Union, that's exactly what's happening. The, the gas remains a very important part of the energy mix, but the utilization of that gas capacity is going down and down. And I think that's, that is a plausible model for gas as a transition fuel that you may have. The way I put it is, you know, you may continue to have lots of gas megawatts right. while having fewer and fewer megawatt hours from gas. Absolutely. So we remain open very rarely, only when it accelerates transition, but we do believe that from time to time that is, that is the case. Makes enormous sense. Laura. Laura. Sorry, we can't hear you, Laura. You're on mute, Laura. They're mute. I want to say it's a great conversation. I've learned a lot. It's been wonderful. I, and I think I would certainly start with Ravi's point. I, I, there's very little. I think we, we are in agreement here on, um, most, on, all, on all of the issues. I would say on the issue that you've last raised, I think it was Ravi who combined development and decarbonization in we that both the, the development institutions and the national governments in uh, the emerging market economies, the developing economies, the Asian economies, the lower income economies, use whatever sort of title you want. We, we have to, it has to be the case that we're thinking about innovation in green finance, we're thinking about regulation, we're thinking about public um, support, direct funding, always in mind with development and decarbonization. Because if you pose this as decarbonization versus development, I think the national governments are not going to go along, the populations are not going to go along. Um, so I think we have to look at, if you're looking at the, uh, in the multilateral development institutions, it's thinking about ways to craft their their loan programs, their uh, their uh, advice programs, even their advice programs, to actually work with governments on how you combine uh, decarbonization and development. Now, in the the uh, Harry talks about a lot about the importance of a carbon price. Well, I'm sitting in a country where I I, I just don't see it. I, I I just don't see it. Okay, and and I'm not sure I see it. <laughs> Any place else, but but perhaps um, I, I I was involved. Uh, There's an election going on right now in France, and I was involved in a presidential commission for uh, giving advice to Macron. And one of the years was climate. And you know, all the economists said, "Well, you have to have a carbon price." He said, "Do you see what happened to me on the carbon price? We're not having a carbon. Forget it. I mean, that's not the main tool we're going to use." So I do think that we have to think about the right uh, tools. And I do think to use, again, the example of the successes in alternative energy, it was not a carbon price. It was actually all of the procurement and subsidies that went and tax credits that went to increase the demand and reduce the price of these uh, alternative energy sources. I mean, without the reduction, uh, Al Gore came to, the United, to uh, Berkeley about a decade ago and said he thought, he predicted what was gonna to happen to prices of solar and wind. And he was considered at the time to be wildly optimistic. And it's, it's done much better. The price lines have looked much better. And that is basically, again, driving down the price of the carbon alternatives rather than driving up the price of the carbon. You just leave it alone. <laughs> um, so I do think uh, that's uh, just an, an, an important point to add. I think, you know, if you think about the multilateral institutions and you think even about a company, I think you have to take into your strategy, you have to take into your lending decisions, you have to take into your investment decisions, you take 
the decarbonization challenge as a major challenge. You that, that's right there at the beginning of the decision-making process. And I think that I would hope that we would see more of that in the multilateral institutions. Uh, so again, it's it's got to be front and center. It's not development versus decarbonization. It is decarbonization and development. And that has to be at the very top of the institution and then filtering through all of the policies of the institution. I think that's a great um, sort of ending of this conversation. And we're going to go to the Q&A, which Emily is going to be kind enough to uh, manage. We have quite a lot of questions, uh, as you can imagine. But let me just say um, that I think we could go on for at least a minimum of one more hour. So I look forward to future conversations on this, but especially as uh, we work uh, at uh, the Bretton Woods Committee on the future of finance in uh, climate. I think everything that you have said today is going to be very critical. And as you said, I think um, all of you said, uh, carbon pricing, while very important, is politically very charged. However, we also know that some of the big investors in, in fact, Singapore are implicitly including it when they make investment decisions. We know insurance companies are doing that. So this might be a case where the private sector and the young people in the world are going to be pricing it implicitly in their decision making, in the way they live, in the way they manage their companies and the way um, investors, sophisticated investors manage their investments because they don't want to be stuck with stranded assets. And as Laura said, you know, the public sector and governments will follow versus lead on this, unlike other areas where the public sector has created the, um, the new technologies that we're using. But has been a really great conversation and I pass it on to you, Emily, for, uh, for the next stage with questions from the audience for the panel. Thank you, Asana. I agree. What, what an incredibly rich discussion and, and a lot of questions, which is always a, a, a sign of a good discussion. Um, we have just a few minutes left, so I'm, I'm just going to take a couple of questions here. I'm first going to go to Stuart McIntosh. Uh, Stuart, if you could unmute yourself and go ahead and pose your question. Stuart, any chance you can unmute your microphone? Yes, thank you very much. It's been an excellent discussion. My question is uh, for Ravi, uh, first of all, congratulations on leading the NGFS. Uh, what chances are for us to move from focus on supervision and climate risk to actually changing the capital charges on lending for fossil fuels to change the incentives directly for lenders to accelerate the rate of transition uh, to the green uh, and net zero goal? Thank you very much. Yeah, Stuart, you've asked the one of the most uh, sensitive questions in, in uh, regulatory circles these days. Um, I, I think um, if if you're looking at capital requirements, and as I'm sure uh, several people will be familiar with the structure of the, the Basel Capital Accord, that's pillar one, pillar two, and pillar three, um, there is um, a st strong... Uh, a will to move uh, decisively on pillar three, which means uh, to disclose climate risks, disclose uh, uh, and, and let uh, market discipline act uh, on, on the banks. Um, pillar two is where we are uh, having uh, deep discussions on. I mentioned earlier on about using climate scenarios, transition risks and uh, physical risks and then to stress test your portfolios against those, those uh, scenarios. Uh, some regulators have said that that could be a basis for applying pillar two capital charges, where because the, your portfolio is not aligned with a 1.5 degree or two degrees pathway, uh, it is going to have stranded assets and going to suffer uh, some uh, deterioration. And therefore you need to set aside additional capital. Um, I don't think we've, there's agreement on that yet, uh, but that is one of the things that are constantly being discussed. Uh, and if that comes to pass, I, I would agree with you, that would be quite a powerful incentive because once you have to pay a capital charge or a future risk uh, based on a stress test, uh, but the quality of these stress tests uh, need to be more rigorous. I think uh, the scenarios work are also at a nascent stage. <clears throat> so as you would imagine, 
uh, it is not a straightforward matter for regulators to do this without getting some of the rigor and uh, analytics right. Um, and the, it's something the financial industry has also been watching very closely and has been giving, giving feedback on. I think the last thing they want is for regulators to rush to slap on capital charges that have little bearing to underlying risk. So we do need to do this right, to do this in a credible way, uh, but rest assured that these are issues that are being actively discussed. I think for pillar one, capital is going to be further out, I'm afraid, uh, partly because capital charges on a risk-weighted assets are applied on the basis of uh, probability of default and loss given default. Now, there's no historical data to get at those things for these green versus brown assets. And, and here, I, I, I must say, I struggle with this too, um, because as a regulator, I know that this is a risk that is coming and that you have to have capital buffers in place for that risk so that you will modify your behavior. Yet, uh, it is a great struggle to find a basis uh, to, to uh, structure those, those requirements on because uh, you don't have the historical data. Uh, this is a, a risk that's coming in the future which doesn't have precedent. And so you're not sure how, how you're gonna calibrate this. But this is going to be a live issue, I can assure you, uh, continually being looked at. And I would also agree with you that some movement on this front uh, would need to be part of the solution. Thank you. Yeah, maybe, maybe I, I can just add as, as, a, as a lender as well. I mean, you know, I, I fully agree with Ravi. I mean, we have to keep moving this way. I think that I, I can add as well that the NGFS, which is, you know, we're, we're very happy to work with, is a, is a fantastic initiative, which is having a real impact. What matters a lot is just the... the don't underestimate the, the 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 impact of disclosure and 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 governance of risk, even if you don't have explicit capital charges, because it's the the, the conversations it is forcing us to have internally. I mean, we are an, uh, the adopter of TCFD, and the conversations that it forces us to have internally and forces us to have with our clients are yeah. really powerful. You know, because it forces you to, and it, it, it exposes you to risks that you just didn't think about. It. And it forces your clients to start thinking about risks that they hadn't thought about. And in practice, so, you know, what is the impact of a capital charge? Ultimately, it increases the cost of capital. To be honest, we're already in a situation where the cost of capital for hydrocarbon investment is significantly higher. And, and for good reason. You know, people, there's, there's less supply of capital for those sorts of investments. And also, um, it, it, it's just much more risky. You know, I would far rather invest in a wind farm where I'm selling electricity without any carbon risk, without any fuel price risk, than, you know, leave aside the sort of, you know, innate natural preference for clean products. Just from a pure hard-headed credit analysis, you would apply a risk premium, right? You apply a risk premium already to hydrocarbon. So I think, you know, further steps in that direction would be welcome, but don't underestimate just how significant disclosure and governance of risk is already in driving up the cost of capital for hydrocarbons. So we're already quite a long way down that road. Thanks, Harry. And I wanna be mindful of time because I know our speakers have a, a hard stop. So I'm gonna just ask uh, Laura to maybe give any final comments and then we'll wrap it up. Well, I would, it's it's a great timing because I will, I would, my comment would have been to essentially go back to the issue of disclosure and metrics because there, there's been a lot going on and it's really all good. I mean, our ability to measure emissions is getting better by the day. There's a wonderful new project, largely nonprofit funded called, I think, Carbon Trace, which is literally now, it's going to be like Google Maps. You're gonna be able to go to a street, to a location on a street and measure carbon emissions. That is what is going to happen. It's happening, it's being developed right now so that there will be, from the investor point of view, here's a project, well, tell me about your emissions. Tell me about your emissions now in this location and how is your net zero pathway gonna reduce those emissions? So great news on metrics that's really happening in real time. And then I would say on disclosure because I think probably Certainly, one of the biggest accomplishments of the COP meeting uh, in Scotland in the fall was the coming together of SASB, TCFD, the IFRS. Uh, now we have this international uh, standard setting board, mm -hmm. 
And investors are demanding this. This is coming because the investors are saying, sorry, we, we have all this money. We've kind of set aside that 57 million billion trillion, excuse me, 57 trillion in assets under management with a green ob objective. But we can't, we're not convinced that we're seeing projects at the level of detail, of disclosure, which leads us to believe that something real is going on versus greenwashing. So I think that we are going to, and then the SEC coming along on this, I mean, I would say this has been led around the world by the investors and the regulators are now responding. The regulators are saying, yeah, okay, we get it. We get the need for comparable, standardized, industry specific, because it's got to be industry specific disclosure on, on, on climate. And that is happening. And so for the private capital market, all that money sitting there ready to be deployed, the investors need to have very clear metrics on what is being accomplished in the decarbonization uh, greening area before they deploy that money. So I'm very optimistic. We will end on that optimistic note. And we've covered a lot of ground. Uh, what, a, what a fantastic conversation. I think my favorite of the week so far. Um, so very much appreciate all of you joining us. Thank you, Efsane, for your moderation. Um, thank you all for, for some really insightful uh, comments and, and thoughtful analysis today. Um, I just want to remind our audience, we have a, a quick turnaround. We'll be back at 2 p.m. Eastern time with U.S. Deputy National Security Advisor, Dalip Singh. So take a break and uh, join us back here at 2 p.m. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, you very much.